Good evening. My name is Patrick Lewis. I'm the Director of Collections and Research here at the Filson Historical Society. Thank you for joining us both in person and virtually for tonight's program. Um, thank you again for joining us for Aging in Place in our Louisville community. What it means, what barriers exist, and what are we doing to address the issue? I'd like to remind those of us joining in person to please silence your cell phones for the duration of the program. Uh, for our in-person attendees, I'll pass a microphone around uh, the room for questions at the end of the panel discussion. If you're joining us virtually, please ask your questions in the chat, and uh, Filson representative will share those as time permits. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce our MC for the evening, Tony Curtis. Tony became executive director of the Metropolitan Housing Coalition in January of 2022, following four years as the MHC Director of Development and Communications. Prior to joining the MHC in April of 2018, Tony worked with me uh, for 11 years at the Kentucky Historical Society in Frankfurt, uh, where he was public historian, documentary editor, a seasoned researcher, and a technical administrator, um, and, and held the place together. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in History with a minor in government from Moorhead State University and a Master of Arts in U.S. History from Marshall University. Turn the mic over to Tony. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. Yes, we were colleagues for about a decade uh, at the Kentucky Historical Society, so it's a good reunion here. Uh, good to be back at the Filson spent many a days uh, uh, in the archives doing research and going through a lot, especially of Civil War collections uh, in my last job there. So it's great to be back here in this, in this great environment. Uh, and, it, and it does one thing that we always talked about, Patrick and I have had these conversations uh, about the history uh, and the importance of history in policymaking. Uh, it's vital to understand what has happened in the past in my world, in our world of housing, uh, and how we are to make better policy and better decisions moving forward. Uh, so thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, this is part of Fair Housing Month. 55 years ago, uh, the Fair Housing Act was passed. Uh, so every April is Fair Housing Month. And we hold usually an event. We were just having a conversation. This is probably the busiest Fair Housing Month I can remember. Lots of events have gone on. A lot of good discussions as it's a hot topic of discussion in the community. Uh, we as a community are in need and a great deal of need of housing. 31,000 units at or below 30% uh, area median income, 55,000 uh, at 50% area median income. There is a great need. People are in dire straits in many conditions. We need new units and we need those units to be everywhere throughout Louisville. Housing and opportunity is a, is a, a housing opportunity, housing choice is a big part of this discussion. So we're combating these historical policy decisions, uh, uh, decisions by government, de decisions by uh, corporations as well, uh, about where people live. Uh, we're in the midst of a big discussion on land development code reform right now that plays right into the fair housing discussion, right? Uh, it ultimately tells you what can be built, where it can be built and where we can live. And so as a part of that conversation too, is uh, talking about aging in place. Uh, so we want to have that conversation tonight, and before we get into it, I want to introduce our panelists here, uh, and I'm going to give them a couple of minutes each to talk a little bit about their organization and how they kind of interface with this topic. Uh, first of all, and I'll go in order here, uh, we have uh, Tanya Salee. Uh, she's a volunteer with the AARP of Kentucky in Age Friendly Louisville, uh, very active in our Education and Advocacy Committee as well. And so I want to give Tanya a little bit of time to talk about AARP and uh, and Age Friendly Louisville. Thanks for being here, Tanya. Hello, everyone. And I'm glad you all came out today to hear about Fair Housing. Uh, as he stated, I am a volunteer with AARP. And also, I work on the Committee for Age Friendly Louisville. Uh, what we do with AARP Livable Communities, we meet with different states every month to see what other cities are doing. So we try to bring ideals here to Louisville to better our community. And also with age-friendly Louisville, we try to work on different areas. And I happen to work in the housing domain with age-friendly Louisville. So what we do with that, we try to think of things and we try to go out in the community 
and get ideas to make our community better. Of course, we're talking about aging in place. And you know, with AARP, that's what we do. We try to advocate for our 50 plus members, but age-friendly Louisville also are concerned with people from the cradle to the grave. We wanna make everybody living um, in a safe community comfortably. So that's a little bit of what I do. Thank you very much, Tanya. Uh, our next panelist is Kat Hartledge. Uh, she is the Education and Outreach Coordinator, and it's gonna take me a while to get used to this, but the Kentucky Fair Housing Council, they used to be the Lexington Fair Ho Housing Council for years, uh, and so they've recently rebranded and it explains actually more of what they do because they're not just Lexington, right? Uh, so I'll let Kat take it over. Yeah, we are the Kentucky Fair Housing Council. So it reflects that we serve the entire state of Kentucky here, though we are headquartered um, in Lexington, not me. I didn't drive from Lexington today, just Valley Station. Um, <laughs> but we are a civil rights nonprofit agency and we work in housing discrimination and we do that through enforcing the Fair Housing Act, um, which is why we're so excited to celebrate its 55th anniversary this year. Uh, we provide free legal representation for folks who face housing discrimination. Um, we do housing advocacy, we do education and outreach, um, and also discrimination uh, testing at our organization. So it's been a really fun uh, Fair Housing Month. We've had a lot of great discussions, um, really great for all the folks that came out. Thank you very much, Kat. Uh, our next panelist is Laura Grabowski. Uh, she is the director of the Louisville Metro Government Office of Housing and Community uh, Development. So Laura, take it away. Sure, good evening, everybody. So our office at the city has, um, I guess, two main focuses. One is obviously housing. Um, we have funding available to provide to developers to build some of these affordable housing units that, uh, that Tony talked about. Some of those have focuses on seniors. Uh, some of them are more, um, more family related. Uh, and then we provide uh, down payment assistance for people who are interested in purchasing homes. We also have home repair grants um, that are mainly used to help keep seniors in their home, uh, their homes. The other side of our team focuses on vacant property issues. So if you've you know, driven through neighborhoods or you start seeing boarded up houses, um, our, that team has uh, about know, five or six people who really focus on that city foreclosure, demolition, uh, the land bank, trying to get those properties back into the into the hands of neighborhood residents. Um, at the city, this is not my actual team, but we also have an Office of Aging and Disabled uh, Citizens, and they do a lot of education and advocacy around, uh, around that. We do work with them um, quite frequently on some of our, you know, we're more of the built environment, more of the bricks and sticks part, um, and they do more um, work with actual clients and providing services. So anyway, thanks. It's good to be here tonight. Thank you, Laura. Uh, and uh, our last panelist, uh, George Sanders. He is the Chief Impact Officer uh, for New Directions Housing Corporation. I'll let him talk a little bit about his work. Well, it's good, great to be here and good evening, everyone. Uh, again, I'm George Sanders, Chief Impact Officer at New Directions. I've been with New Directions for about six years after a, a fairly extensive corporate career, and I love the work that I do. It's it's a lot more fulfilling than selling widgets, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, it, at New Directions, uh, our focus, we're a community development corporation, and our focus is, our principal focus is on providing affordable housing for individuals of very low income. Uh, we've got 900 units, and most of those are occupied by individuals whose income is 30% or less of the area median. Uh, we've been in existence for 52 years, uh, and our origin is out of... Uh, out of the St. Williams Church in, in West Louisville. We are, um, we are an organization that, that runs a number of different programs. We Repair Our Fair is, is our signature volunteer program. On an annual basis, we, we engage around 1,000 volunteers who go out and do free home repairs for elderly and disabled homeowners. 
uh, although we serve uh, clients across the community, it's predominantly in West Louisville that, that we serve. We recently, uh, just a couple years ago, launched a, a, um, a self family self-sufficiency program using some of the HUD uh, uh, programming. IRISE is just a phenomenal program. We're helping individuals uh, who have, have generationally been involved in public housing, subsidized housing, and they're now beginning to reach out and look for opportunities to grow and to live independently. And the final area that, uh, that we're, we in, we're involved in is uh, we acquire and rehab vacant and abandoned properties for resale, primarily to uh, low-income uh, families. Very good. Thank you, George. Um, and so uh, a lot of the work that happens in this community is a coalition. Uh, MHC is a coalition, but this is part of the broader coalition here that works on uh, large housing issues and aging in place is one of those big issues. Uh, so let's start with a, just a basic question. Um, you know, what is aging in place? Um, and it's fair housing, but what, what makes it a fair housing issue? Uh, and I'm going to go with Kat. Would you like to start the conversation? Sure. So aging in place is just the ability to live in one's home safely, comfortably, and independently uh, as you age. So it's just being able to make those accommodations and to have a safe place to stay as you get older. Um, it's a fair housing um, issue. Well, first of all, what is fair housing is the fair housing ex prohibits uh, discrimination on the basis of one's protected classes. So the protected classes under fair housing are race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, disability, um, and um, sexual orientation and gender identity. So with all those combined, we see cases for folks um, in order to be able to age in place, right? There's a lot of components of that. The most common one is disability. So we'll get a lot of cases um, for individuals to be able to stay in their home. They'll need to make um, a reasonable accommodation or a reasonable modification to their home. So those are just making slight changes. It could be um, that they need to be moved to a unit that's maybe on the first floor. It could be meaning to put uh, garbage, uh, handrails into your bathroom, anything like that. Um, you have the ability to ask to do so um, through the Fair Housing Act. Um, so we often help individuals with that. Um, but it also comes to play in other ways. Um, we have seen it with... Um, gender identity and sexual orientation and same-sex couples trying to make sure that they're able to get into senior housing um, and uh, be accepted as a couple. Um, and also uh, when we think of race, because through racial discrimination, we've had people get blocked from being able to acquire wealth in their housing, being able to buy homes, especially I think we think the Fair Housing Act was only passed 55 years ago. So there's a lot of individuals who didn't even have the protection when trying to buy a home, right? So there's definitely a big uh, wealth gap in housing due to racial discrimination that also uh, plays in. When, and so when we get cases like with appraisal discrimination or things like that, that block individuals being able to get that housing wealth, um, that factors in as well. Very good. Uh, any of the other panelists want to jump in on this question? I would like to chime in on that because uh, what AARP does is they try to empower the, oh, well, the more experienced <laughs> population mm -hmm. on giving them a choice to live where they want to live and how they want to age. And so what they did is they did a survey um, and what came up was over the majority of them chose to live in their own homes. That's what they wanted to do. And only like a third said, okay, we'll consider moving to another community. But there you see people want to age in their own homes. And on that, we also looked at how uh, the unfairness came into play. If you want to stay in your own home, there have to be public service in that community. So to me, that was a little bit unfairness because if you walk the communities, 
do you see all of those services in the community? So I, we felt that that was unfair. So as far as the integrated land use, they need to take a look at that to make sure that the com commercial and retail uses are there along with transportation. Transportation is another one. As we age, we don't want to drive or we can't drive. So in that community, is there adequate transportation? It's not fair because we can't drive anymore. So we need to look at that transportation in that community. And also, as I stated, we want people to have choices. So there's housing. So is there adequate housing for accessibility? Is there adequate housing for the person who don't have that income level? So we felt that was unfair. Thank you, Tanya. Did I see you, George, wanting to say something? Yeah, um, from, from a new directions perspective, we, again, we were a, our primary service is providing housing. So we're, we are a landlord. Uh, and as a landlord, then our, we have to respond to the, to the needs and requirements of our, of our resident population as they age. Disability is probably from a fair housing perspective, uh, that's the biggest issue that we have to contend with in terms of responding to the disability of our, of our residents. Uh, we're, we, are, we have a, a policy that's very focused on responding, putting in handrails, grab bars, trying to position uh, the units so that we provide access through wider doors as we're remodeling. We're in the process of remodeling a number of our units now, and we want to make sure that 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 those units are 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 reconfigured, rehab in a way that allows them to be occupied by elderly residents. On the other hand, is our repair program for existing homeowners. This is something we've been doing re, uh, free home repairs for thirty years. And one of the things that we noticed is that we do a repair, put a new roof on, on a home for a resident, and then we go back the next year because they asked for, in addition to the, the roof, they also needed some drywall work done, but we could only afford to do one one year. The next year, we plan to go back and do the drywall, and we find out that residents no longer there. Well, what happened? Well, they, they didn't have the ability to have free movement in the house because of mobility issues as they aged. And so one of the things that, that brought to us was an, a recognition that we need to be responsive to the needs of, of that population by doing aging in place rehab of the, of the home, where we would say, okay, if you're an existing homeowner, and you now need ramps, or you need a handrail, a grab bar, or you need maybe maybe you're you're falling because of you you're going to the bathroom at night and you can't reach the light, and so we put in motion sensitive lights. So those are the kinds of things that we we're trying to respond to. I've got this sheet here; it's got five numbers on it, and I just want to go through them real quickly because. This is what aging in place means to new directions from a home repair perspective. One in three, that's the number of seniors in the state of Kentucky age 65 and older who reported a fall in 2018. 10% of that, of that third, 10% of those required hospitalization. 651 million, that's how much money was spent in Kentucky in the years 2019, 2020 for, for medical treatment as a result of falls, 57,000. That's the average amount that was spent on, on individuals who fell in their home in Jefferson County in 2019. That's the medical treatment. Again, not everybody requires medical treatment, but when you do, that's what it is, 15,000. That's the average cost of a rehab. And so if you think about it, if, if, if you're going to spend $57,000 on medical treatment versus $15,000 on a rehab, it probably makes sense to be proactive in making some changes in the home. 
Uh, we've been doing running our aging in place program for about two years now. And I'll give you one example and then I'll, I'll turn it over. We had one uh, homeowner who had fallen 11 times in the previous six months. Uh, as a result of, of the program that we implement where we actually send an occupational therapist out to the home with our construction manager and we conduct a number of assessments and activities, activities of daily living assessment, an instrumental activities of daily living assessment, and three other assessments for each homeowner. And then we, we determine what rehab retrofit is required to uh, make that home safe. Well, as a result for this one homeowner, they went from, from 13, 11 falls in six months to one fall and in the house and one fall outside the home. So we were able to have a profound impact on changing the safety for, uh, of that home for that individual. Thank you for that example, great. Uh, and just to think with Georgia's numbers, there are about 100,000 people in Louisville that are 65 years and older. So you can see that impact on Louisville, Jefferson County. Uh, so to transition a little bit, we we'll talk about some of the barriers that exist there really on the, the micro level. Uh, so if we could talk about it, maybe from a larger perspective in Louisville, maybe from policy perspective, uh, maybe even from a funding perspective in Louisville, what, what barriers are we fighting against or do we come up against frequently uh, in Louisville? Um, Laura, maybe from LMG? Yeah, sure. Um, so with our, with the city's funding, one of the things that I was going to say for the last question is it's, um, I think when we think about aging in place, we tend to think about the, I don't even know what age to put, but like the 90 plus people, you know, who may need, um, need, may need some accommodations. And of course there are people of all ages who need that. But one thing that we are actually seeing with our funding that we, that we are, um, that we're, that we're, that we're allocating, sorry, I couldn't think of that word for senior apartments, whether it's new or preservation is now, I guess that the baby boomers are hitting the um this age people really want activity so where yes we have to think about um grab bars and you know large uh large larger doorways um i just went to um a, a grand opening last week and they had added a fitness center a hair salon a community room and a dog park outside because people, you know, especially um, older adults who might be living alone, really, you know, they wanted to bring their dogs. So um, I, I think it's important to remember that they're, you know, aging in place, whether you're a renter or a homeowner, it, I think like Tanya had said, I mean, you know, you want amenities, you still want to be as active as possible. Um, you just want to be able to do it in 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 your area, and that's been something that's been a little bit eye opening for us um, the past the past couple of years. But um, one of the barriers that we recently were able to change um, has to do with something that you, know, you might again not think about as aging in place, but there. Uh, there is something in the land development code that allows the very formal term of accessory dwelling units. And these are um, properties that everyone knows about. It's like the apartment above the garage or it's the um, the mother-in-law house on the same on the same um, piece of land. And that used to be only only allowed in certain areas of town. And there were some amendments that were passed within the past couple of years that as long as you are uh, living in one of those units, you can rent out the other one. Um, and what we've seen is that a lot of um, older adults, this has been pretty popular, at least with the questions that we're getting because you know, there is a, they own a house, it's big, they would like to downsize, but, you know, they're not really ready to completely move. And so either they have moved into the, you know, the, the small, the smaller piece on the property, and then they rent out their house or they, you know, their children move in or whatever, or they stay there and then they're able to get, um, they're able to have, we've, we've also seen that from people who their parents have moved in uh, into the actual accessory dwelling unit. So 
And Tony was talking about the land development code. Um, one of the, uh, I mean, a major change that we're attempting to make is that we would like to be able to get uh, multifamily uh, allowed more places in town. We're really missing a lot of, um, they call it missing middle again, it's a formal name, but you know, these four plexes and eight plexes that, um, that are in the older parts of town, we don't really have that. We either have the 300 units of apartments or we have the single family houses. So when we, you know, again, it's, it's an aging in place um, issue. People want to be able to stay where they are. Um, and that might mean some accommodations. People want to be you know, especially, well, not especially, but people want to be around other people with the same, um, with the same wants. That's why, you know, you see in the retirement communities, you've got pickleball courts and you've got, you know, this, that, and the other thing that everybody can, can get together. So anyway, um, we're trying to, we're trying to figure out and, and move some of the, uh, the funding and the policy priorities more toward making this an age friendly city, what does that look like? I mean, we have a ton of grandparents raising grandkids. So in that scenario, we can't just focus on the grandparent and that they need grab bars. We also have to focus on, um, on, the, on the children and getting them to school and making sure they have somewhere safe to play. So sometimes when we are working with the parks department, we are trying to, um, you know, get the playground for the kids. And, um, and again, 10 years ago, you know, we would have said, oh, we need a bench for the grandparents. Now it's, we need a walking path for the grandparents and we need, um, or, you know, we need some, um, some of those exercise areas or, or, you know, a biking path. So anyway, it's, it's, we try to make it pervasive in everything that, that we do is how to, how to make sure that um, younger, older people can, can all experience and enjoy the same things. Very good. Uh, yeah. And I think uh, just thinking on a night when the mayor announced his budget this evening uh, or this earlier this afternoon at four o'clock, you know, you've got to think about that funding perspective. We talk a lot about land development code, but a lot of time it's divorced from that larger conversation of how do we fund some of this work? Mm -hmm. uh, we also face the real issues of, you know, 75% of Louisville's land is, is zoned for single family housing. So these are changes that need to happen in order to bring these types of establishments. Uh, so any other, maybe from on the ground, uh, any barriers, I mean, from a daily basis from your membership or people who call your office thinking Kat or Tanya here, what you're hearing from folks or what barriers they're facing? Yeah, we mostly um, have individuals who just need um, reasonable accommodations or modifications. Disability is our largest um, case that we get. Um, so helping people access that, but also helping individuals um, access funding for that, because if you need to make um, a modification, even though you should be granted that ability um, uh, by your landlord, it doesn't always mean that the landlord has to fund it, right? So being able to connect them with resources and connect them with those places to be able to be like, okay, well, how do we build the ramp and how do we be able to pay for these um, uh, modifications for individuals. Um, I would also say that we do a lot of um, discrimination testing on um, new building to make sure that when it's being built, it's being built with um, ADA um, in mind and that they're following those guidelines. So that's mm -hmm. something we see on the ground a lot. Um, but Louisville has a lot of older buildings. Um, and so that is really, really tricky and where you don't have as much um, accommodation in those. And so that's always usually a barrier. Thank you, Kat. Um, and so we've talked a little bit about this, but thinking about what projects are going on, are there very, any creative projects uh, that are in process right now, or maybe you've heard talk around town, because we're a small town, right? Uh, about, uh, about new developments that might take on these issues, might make it a better living situation for people who want the age in place. Um, Want to hear some thoughts on that? At, at New Directions, uh, we are in the process of, of closing on um, a deal that will allow us to uh, construct uh, 46 new units, senior housing in the uh, Ro Roosevelt Apartments in the Portland neighborhood. Uh, what's really exciting about, about this particular development is that, that it, there is a, a focus on incorporating technology to help create uh, a safer environment for elderly uh, homeowners or elderly residents of, of the property. 
for ex for example, uh, we, we're rather than just a traditional electric stove, we're putting in one that will turn itself off if it if you if it overheats. We're trying to to be cognizant of of some of the some of the needs of of El we we deliberately uh, uh, position this property so that it is across the parking lot from a a um, a, a family uh, facility uh, a family apartment complex and we're going to be doing some programming with like foster grannies and some of those kinds of things where we we are able to connect the children that are resident across the parking lot with the with the seniors. Uh, the, the needs, you know, while we're building 46 units and we're really excited about that, you know, the need it, that continues to grow. 10,000 people uh, a year turn 65. By, by I think it says 2050, 20% uh, of of the the population will be over age sixty five, uh, and and so as as our population ages, then this need grows, uh, and resources are are fairly limited. We're constrained there, so so the the ability to provide responses that are necessary to meet the needs of of an aging population are going to be. I'm, I'm, I'm I'm on that track myself. I just turned 66, and so you know I I'm hoping that 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 I will be able to uh, live independently. But if not, what kinds of modifications can I make to my my living environment? And that's really part of the the accommodations. That's a real primary focus for us at New Directions, and it does seem to be delivering some positive impact in the lives of those that were served. And just to chime in on that, as Louisville grows, there's a great need for diverse and affordable housing. So a lot of things that we do, we advocate and we educate. Uh, one of the things uh, she was talking about ADUs, we got on the floor, we listened to the, what the people wanted in the community. And we got on the floor running and we advocated to build ADUs. ADUs was a real long stream process to get a uh, permit to build. So what we did is we put our voices out there to tell the Metro Council, we need to shorten this process up. And guess what? We won. So now the process is not so long so a person can get a permit to build an ADU. And as I, my story was that I wish when my mom was around, that was there because she wanted that independence, mm -hmm. but she didn't want to live with me. So if I could have built her an ADU, I could make sure she got to the doctor, okay? And she still would have had her independence. Mm -hmm. So I was glad we worked really hard on that. And another thing that's happening now uh, we have uh, in works uh, educating people on the middle missing housing uh, that's going on now because missing middle housing is an option where the older uh, population and even the younger to miss the old with the young mm -hmm. in this duplex or uh, quad or even a courtyard. Uh, they can thrive off of one another. So now that's the piece that we're working on. We're working with the coordinator of planning and design services. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been having walking tours to give people an example of what they look like. And of course, you know, the one barrier that we have is zoning because you just can't put up that type of housing anywhere because of the zoning. So we're going to try to work on that piece to get that lifted so we can get this middle housing. So as you say, I'm part of baby boomers, my empty nest, but I want to converse with people. So if I'm living in a courtyard, I can deal with the young, the old, old and it won't be so expensive because we're on one piece of property 
and, and it won't be high rent there. So that's a piece that we're working on. Very good. Other thoughts before? Um, I just want to remind we if you have questions, we have a microphone. Uh, so please raise your hand uh, as the conversation proceeds here. We also have folks uh, with us virtually as well. So um, if you have questions coming in that way, please introduce those. Um, so I, I guess we talked a little bit about money. Was any thinking, I mean, ultimately, right? A lot of this comes down to, to funding issues. Uh, when we saw influxes of federal dollars during COVID, uh, did our ARPA dollars, any of the dollars that came to the city, were those connected to possibilities for aging in place? Yes, sort of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the American Rescue Plan dollars have been uh, I don't even know what to say about them. I mean, it's more money than I've, I thought I'd ever see in my career. Um, and the council and the administration dedicated more money than they ever had to affordable housing. So one of those things that we talked about earlier is there are new units being built. And some of those are specifically for seniors. I know that there is one that our team has been working with the developer on. It's um, it's on Hurstbourne. So it's a Hurstbourne senior apartments. Um, and that is a bit unique for us because it's pretty, uh, we just don't often see affordable housing in, in the East. So we of course want to see that uh, more frequently. Um, but anyway, th so that's one option. But what I actually was going to speak about was one of our huge needs in town, we've all alluded to it a little bit is if you're a homeowner, and you need repairs either for aging in place specifically or for deferred maintenance and aging in place. And um, the city runs a home repair program. It's grant funds that pay contractors to do this work. And so in the American Rescue Plan, plan uh, the council dedicated an additional $4 million for, uh, for home repair grants. Um, so last or this current fiscal year that we're in that runs July to June, we have more funding than we've than we've ever had. It was eight and a half million. Now, what we've done with that is we have prioritized seniors. Um, most uh, most people who apply for this program are under fifty percent area median income, and most people are over uh, over sixty two. Not not everybody, but the vast majority. So um, we prioritized seniors and um, um, we prioritized seniors and people with this disability. And when we opened on July 1st, we have enough funding for about 350 people and we had 1100 applications in seven hours. So, I mean, you know, going back to the last question, when you talk about barriers, I mean, I don't, you know, I don't even know what the amount of money is that would be needed to, to really fill this need. We had to, we had to close the applications and we're, we're still working on, on, on getting those people um, served. And what we then did was we had to overlay people who had uh, a system failure. Um, there was a lady who sat in my office on July 1st and I was helping her with her application. And she said that she laid in her bed at night and looked up at the stars um, because there was a hole in her roof. So, it, you know, we had to, so it wasn't just, you know, at first we thought, oh, we'll prioritize seniors. And then it's like, okay, ever, essentially everybody's a senior. We hope okay, we'll prioritize seniors and, you know, people with disabilities. Okay. That kind of, and then it's like, okay, finally fail, failing systems. So, I mean, we have some real challenges in town, um, with our, with our senior population, especially those of uh, low to moderate income, because there's just been a lot of deferred maintenance and there is no access to, to capital. And that's gonna let, get me to another thing and then I'll stop talking. But then what we see is when we start talking to the homeowners, uh, we it, this is a grant program, it doesn't require repayment, but we do have to get income information. And so sometimes they, you know, people, tell you a lot more information than even you need. Um, but what we've seen is a lot of predatory lending practices uh, geared toward our seniors. And uh, it, it to specifically uh, like two weeks ago, there was a woman who 
had a um, had needed funding for something to help her family, and and she had gone and taken out um, like a refinance on her house. She had it was paid off, but it wasn't through a normal bank, and it had terrible terms. And so um, one of our uh, nonprofit partners worked with her to to get her back on something. But the the point of that is that the house appraised at a thousand dollars. I mean, excuse me, a hundred thousand dollars. And I think she needed 50. So she could have easily gone to a bank is my point, you know, standard financial institution. And that's what our nonprofit partner did. So that's one of the things that, that even our, you know, our intake team and our rehab specialists, when they're out, we're trying, we're training them to look for that because these are the people who are knocking on the doors. Um, and, and taking the equity that has been, you know, built up over, over decades, um, we also have a partnership with Legal Aid where we uh, we get our home repair clients in to get life planning documents. They don't call them wills because nobody likes to talk about dying, but um, it is in a very important way to prevent vacant and abandoned properties. And it's a very important way to, of course, um, uh, you know, keep your wealth uh, within your family. So we, even though we are the, the building people, we, we do see the need um, and there and there are lots of them. So it's not just for the the bricks and mortar. It's also you know for the wraparound services to to go with that too. I just want to uh, follow up on on that that point. Uh, the um, if you're a homeowner, it's recommended by most housing experts that you set aside one to three percent of the value of the property uh, on an annual basis for unexpected repairs. But if you're living on at 40% of the area median income, you, you struggle just to pay your bills, buy food, pay for prescription meds. You, you, and so what ends up happening is deferred maintenance. Right. And then it gets so bad at some point that, that the homeowners end up walking away, which creates the prolifer proliferation of vacant and abandoned properties. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the, the work that 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 the city is doing, the investment that they've made, and the and the work that New Directions and other uh, nonprofit partners are doing is critical to trying to arrest some of that that growth in in the in the number of vacant and abandoned units, and and also give give that homeowner an opportunity to remain uh, aging aging in place in their in their home and to create generational wealth. Because if we can if we can arrest those problems that are uh, impacting the integrity, the structural integrity of the house, the safety of the house, the homeowner stays there. They pass it on through uh, through a will, hopefully, uh, to the to the next generation. Because a lot of a lot of these homeowners do not have end of life documentation in place, and so it it really becomes important. That that we take these kinds of rehab steps in order to uh, stabilize the neighborhood. Very good, thank you. Um, I, I'm trying to figure out where I want to go with that. That's, <laughs> um, I guess, thinking about repair programs and back to the funding issue again. So, city level, state level, federal level, where are the dollars coming from for these types of programs? Yeah, it, I mean, for for us, for the city, it's mainly federal dollars, and um, well, it's it really is mainly federal dollars. What we really see is that we need. Uh, my um, team laughs at me because I always call I call it an ecosystem, but we need an ecosystem of home repair program. So we we when you know on July second when we can't take applications anymore, we tell people to call New Directions. New Directions only has a certain amount of slots and repair fare. You know, uh, there are a couple of other nonprofits that have tiny programs, but it, otherwise our staff has to say for the next 364 days, we don't have anything. And they're listening to the, I have a hole in my roof too. My furnace isn't working and it's five degrees outside. Um, we have been looking at, well, I guess I'll say this. We, we've been looking at, because we've been forced to look at loan funds we don't love them. We don't want to loan funds. We don't want to loan funds to seniors. We don't want to loan funds to, to households at um, you know 50% of the area median income or less. But these are, to Tony's point, these are the funding 
options that are available. So, you know, a bank will contact us and say, oh, I've got, you know, $3 million you can loan out. And I was like, uh, okay, you know, I've got another, you know, I'll match your million with a million for a loan. And it, it, it so it, there seems to be a proliferation of that, but we looked at, um, I think it, it was Philadelphia, not Pittsburgh, and they they did this sort of ecosystem. So their home repair program was very similar to ours. It's like emergency, you know, hole in roof furnace isn't working. And then um, depending, you know, they had options for people of maybe 80 to 120% of their immediate income that was a no interest loan. And then over that, it, they just had gone through what is the actual need in town. They had done a survey and asked people, you know, if, if, there, were a, if there were a problem with your house would you be able to pay for it? Would you not be able to pay for it? Um, it so uh, anyway, I know I'm, I'm getting off of topic, but our main funding is federal. That also comes with strings and it also takes a while to spend. And I'm not complaining federal government about it, but um, it. I really think we in Louisville need a, uh, we need way more options uh, for, for this kind of deferred maintenance for everybody, but especially for specifically for aging in place. At, at New Directions, which again runs probably the the largest non-governmental free home repair program, uh, our dollars are philanthropic, uh, and so it's 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 individuals, it's organizations, it's some of the local family foundations that have provided us with funding. But at some point, they 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 look at us and say, "Guys, you you've got to become self-sustaining." We, we can't continue to, to fund this program because that means that we can't provide funding to other organizations. So that therein lies the, the, the challenge, challenge for us. The, uh, we intentionally uh, uh, limit who can qualify for a repair. You've got to be at a 50% or less of the area median income. You have to be age 60 or, or older. And the reason for that is because we are oversubscribed. Even with those limitations, we get 400 requests a year. We are able to help about 225 to 250. So every year we know that something close to 40% of the people who ask are gonna be turned away. And th for those that, that do ask that need help, they say that they need a roof. We've got a volunteer team that can come out and clean clean the fence row. We can't do the roof because we don't have the dollars to be able to pull that off. And so it becomes, uh, financing is a, is a real challenge. Uh, you, you do make an impact and you smile when you, when you know that you, you've changed someone's life and they're now able to live comfortably. But then you look behind you and you say, oh yeah, but I got these other 50 people that are waiting in line that I can't assist. So originally I was going to ask, when you have a new development and you're thinking about your own population and maybe with the idea that they're going to stay in place, you know, are you thinking about locations that are providing for complete streets or style off in your life and um in the one track and all those kinds of things? And the other question I had was, I understand you guys are looking at people who have holy things or the furniture is still gone. But in terms of aging in place, um, have you thought about certified living in place specialists who if their their whole job is to find a keep in a home and maybe they can come up with um more economical ideas and then you can with all the straight further to do those not totally, but other things that we can bring can I answer the second question first, okay? Um, what we do through through the New Direction Aging in Place program, someone uh, call, contacts us and says that they need repairs. We triage that and look at it and say, okay, what is the, the specific need? Some of the work can be done by a volunteer team. And so we will, we will assign a volunteer team to go and do some fairly light work. Some of that, sometimes it's, it's high-skilled, but it's mostly low-skilled kinds of issues. Then we also, the next level is a contractor where we just, we, uh, it's, they need a new HVAC system, we'll put one in, and we have a contract with a firm that does that kind of work. Uh, 
And then the, the third area is where someone indicates that they have, they need handrails, grab bars, they've fallen. And what we do in that case is that we send a, um, a certified occupational therapist, a licensed occupational therapist out to the home and they conduct a number of assessments. They observe the homeowner moving around. How do they navigate their home to determine what the fall risks are, what needs to be done? So they, when they say we need a handrail or a grab bar, it's not just let's put a handrail around the toilet or in the tub. It's at, at what angle, at what length does it need to be? So this is being these decisions are being made by a, an occupational therapist who is licensed, who understands you know, leverage and how, what it's going to take in order to get out of there. Do they need a, a need the, the uh, vanity to be lowered? Do we need to convert this from a bathtub, clawfoot tub to a walk-in shower? Uh, those are the kinds of decisions that are being made with the uh, occupational therapists involved. So it's not just a one size fits all. Everybody gets, gets the full, uh, full Monty. You can answer. I think so. So to the first question, yes, when we have funding available to affordable housing developers, we have a pretty intense scoring list of scoring criteria and everything that you listed is part of that, whether it's senior housing or not senior housing. Um, we, you know, uh, developments will score higher, you know, if, if it is, uh, near a tarp line, if it is walkable, if there are street lights, if there are amenities, if it's frankly in an area where there isn't a lot of affordable housing already. Um, but we, uh, and then I'm trying to think on the aging in place, I guess what I will say is we deal, we, you know, most of our senior, most of our clients are seniors, but if someone is calling with, I need a ramp or I need, um, uh, that's their main complaint. We have a partnership with Center for Accessible Living where we provide funding to them. And so a lot of people will go through their program and that is one thing that they would do. But I I would actually be open to thinking about that for our home repair program. I think our inspectors do uh, you know the, the best that they can do. You know, they'll purchase um, like ther thermostats that are, you know, kind of big with big numbers and they are trying to work through you know what do you need but I, I don't I mean they're certainly not certified aging in place specialists and they're not probably looking 10 years in the future they're kind of to your point about the hole in the roof they're really trying to deal with like survival mode let's get you to stay in this house for another uh, you know another five years so I think that's a, you know I like the idea it's a good one okay in the back we have a question So I, I will answer this partially because I also heard the mayor's budget address at four o'clock today. So this is very new information to me as well as everyone else. But um, but I'll start by saying, 
the it's not necessarily our office, but in our uh, cabinet economic development, that is one thing that, that they really work on is trying to get the businesses back. And it becomes this um, back and forth where they, the business, the people who are trying to get money to the businesses say we need residents to support the businesses. And so they'll kind of yell at us to get more housing built and more infill housing built. And then we'll say, well, we could build more housing and get more people here if we had corner grocery stores and if we, you know, we had more businesses. So it's really a both. And, you know, we need to do um, so economic development. And I, I know other economic development um, agencies around town are working very hard to, to try to develop small business owners. Um, and then on our, actually on our vacant property side, we are trying very hard to get the uh, the corner stores that were abandoned and you know hopefully are still standing back into the the hands of responsible ownership, which is the whole other uh, um, a, a whole other set of challenges. But in the mayor's budget, uh, he announced a couple of things that speak directly to your question. One was six million dollars in subsidies for grocery stores in food deserts where there aren't any, don't have any other details about that other than um, I know that that would, he, he mentioned in his budget address that that would support downtown and in the West um, uh, grocery stores. And then there was, I don't remember the amount, I want to say like 8 million for a downtown revitalization fund. And again, I don't have a lot of details on that, but it sounded a little bit to me like it would do what you're talking about. You know, we need, um, we obviously need, especially in the central business district, some revitalization and some new, uh, some new things coming along and hopefully new affordable things, because that's then the other, <laughs> the other side of it. We don't need the, um, we probably need the fancy grocery store and we need the not so fancy grocery store. So it, I think that there is a lot of momentum to um, to make that happen, um, and those are just a couple of a couple of options that may be coming shortly. And one of the things that I had mentioned that we're working on, and it's that miss and middle house, and that's one of the things that will bring the neighborhood back together. I would think so, also. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said in the beginning, we see those things and. Half of the things are listening to the community and also the community need to go get in that policymaker phase and let your voice be heard of some of the things you need out there. They're not going to change anything unless we start telling them this is what this area needs and we have to get in our face. Yeah. And if you're looking as an individual places to like start learning, I think Center for Neighborhoods offers like classes you can take to really start to learn about like, how do you do this advocacy work? And how do you talk about building a better neighborhood? Or just like find the organization that's doing the work that you are like, yes, that's it. That's what I'm about and follow them. They usually have good opportunities to like do that advocacy work too. I, th I think one thing I'll add is that the city, I mean, the county, we are close to out of green space to build. And um, it's sad that we had to get to this point, but we have a lot of infill housing options in, you know, in the, uh, well, frankly, inside the Watterson. Um, and so if Louisville is to grow, and of course we want it to grow and create more, uh, you know, have more people and create more, more tax revenue, um, we're going to have to build in the infill, which will fill in the neighborhoods, which will bring the amenities. So it's it's a it's a domino effect if we can if we can keep keep moving the needle. Very good. Uh, thank you. I'm going to. I have one more question. Uh, I'm going to start to wrap things up, but I want to thank again the Filson Historical Society for hosting this and partnering on this uh, event this evening. Uh, we need to have more of these conversations uh, in, in these spaces. Uh, so thank, thank you all for doing that. And also it's nice to have, always have a great panel. It makes my job really easy as moderator when you work with great people. Uh, so thank you all for, for comments tonight. And just kind of some closing thoughts. I always like to end with a call to action. So here it is. What can people do? We talked a little bit about reaching out to policymakers, talking to policymakers. How, how, how do you get involved? What, who do you talk to? Who do, uh, how do you best suggest that people use their energy and their their time that they have? I will say two things. One, just because I work for the city that we 
We just started the budget process. This will go through June. So um, similar to what Kat said, this is the time to, you know, pay attention and ask, you know, why, uh, you know, why isn't this in the budget? Why is this? Could we move this to that? And that's through your council person, the mayor's office, um, you know, keep, uh, just keep, keep up with that. Uh, but the other thing is, there are there's only so much that the city can do and the nonprofit partners can do and I think every one of us can do something um, and it, whether you know whether there is someone who is older than me living on my street and I notice that their um, yard needs to be mowed and I'm going to check on them or I'm saying hey have you you know have you hooked up with new directions as far as resources I mean I think that there are things that we can do if we belong to churches you know, hey, pastor, so-and-so, have we sent money to blah, 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 to, you know, what about, if, you know, what if we um, create some kind of a volunteer uh, project too? I mean, we we see the numbers, you know, um, older people are everywhere. This is not just a, a one location problem. So I think that, um, I think we need to use our voices to make sure that um, that older people do not get left behind. Okay, George? I, I guess I, I would say in terms of what can you do? Uh, one is uh, one thing that I think you can do is is that either you or someone you know might want to consider volunteering for some of our free home repair programs. How do we help those uh, elderly homeowners who struggle to maintain their own property? Uh, and so, encouraging encouraging friends, acquaintances, coworkers, children grandchildren to get involved in in these kinds of kinds of programs is always beneficial. Uh, secondly, I would say is that that if you have uh, resources, we're again the work this work is done based on the generosity of individuals, organizations, and uh, we can't do it without without the support of of the philanthropic community. So anything that you can do to either encourage others to participate or to actually provide direct support would certainly be appreciated. Kat? Yeah, I would just kind of echo some of what I was talking about earlier in that finding kind of the organization that fits with you, aging in place, like we talked about a lot today, it's a really big issue. So find that niche that you think you're really interested in or you have that expertise and find the organization that's doing that work and get involved with them. I think our housing groups um, here in Louisville do a really good job of coalition building and getting folks out and making sure people know about opportunities. So kind of find the one that works with you um, and get involved and advocate because yeah, now with the budget, it's a great time um, to be involved in those local discussions. And, Tanya. and I just want to say, I guess we also need to do a better job because half of the battle is knowing we need to educate more we need outreach more because sitting here listening today a lot of the places are offering things but do anyone know what they're offering who knows to go to new direction or so forth so we probably need to do a better job of education and outreach and that was a perfect segue because uh, one way is we have the state of metropolitan housing report Paper copies are out on the table as you came in or are going out. We produce that every year, the Metropolitan Housing Coalition with our partners at UofL. Uh, it has the best, most comprehensive look at housing policy in our community, where Louisville is, and kind of a roadmap forward and recommendations that come out of that. So it's a great education tool. Uh, there are a couple other opportunities coming up. Uh, Greg Colburn, one of the authors of uh, Homelessness is a Housing Problem, We'll be here May 16th uh, at the Kentucky Center. It's free and open to the public. Go hear him. Uh, it's going to be a good talk. And then Lance Freeman will be here on June 6th as well as a part of our annual meeting talking about racial equity uh, and zoning issues. So getting at the heart of a lot of this. So thank you again for coming out. Uh, we appreciate it. Thanks again to the panelists for your conversation. And everybody have a great evening.